So I'm going to present on interviews we did of Israelis and Palestinians drinking ayahuasca together. And uh, the interviews were done uh, and the whole process together with Antoine and Natalie. Antoine Saka is a Palestinian activist uh, and we went for a month long ro road trip in Israel, Palestine and uh, to interview many people. Natalie joined us for a few days, but in, in general, we developed this, uh, re this research and future research together. So, uh, the outline of the talk, I'll give some background, some changes that people went through. I'll talk about trauma, connection to land, all is one, and peace starts from within. So, implications of these things. Uh, we interviewed 18 Israelis and 13 Palestinians. Uh, out of the Palestinians, six were Muslim, seven Christian, four Palestinians living in Palestine, in the West Bank, in the occupied territories, and nine of the Palestinians live in Israel with Israeli citizenship. We interviewed 30, 13 women, 17 men, and one gender nonconforming, and all of our interviewees drank between 10 to 100, some, some even 500 times, even more, uh, so they're all uh, quite experienced. Uh, the intention of the the, these circles was a regular ayahuasca intention, so psycho-spiritual uh, healing. So the intention of these circle was not reconciliation. It just happened to be that the space is mixed of uh, Jewish and Arabs together in the same space, but the intention was not reconciliation. The interview is conducted in Arabic, Hebrew, and English. So uh, the setting, uh, mainly, sh mainly male shamans, though there are a few uh, women as well, but mainly people drank uh, with male shamans or facilitators. The locations were Palestine, Israel, Europe, Brazil, and Peru. Uh, mainly a minority of Palestinians within the group. So uh, let's say out of a, a group of 15 people, four Palestinians, uh, though some groups were more half-half. Many times the Israeli and Palestinians uh, sit separately by choice in these spaces, and they say that language is the main reason to do so, so it's comfortable to sit, sit with somebody who has the same mother, mother, tongue as, mother tongue as you. The cultural setting is uh, New Age, Amazonian shamanism, Buddhism, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity. And when I say New Age, I, I want to focus on the element of New Age, which is inner spirituality. So maybe the core of New Age, something that we probably mo uh, many here share, is the idea of inner, inner spirituality, idea, ideas of universalism, okay? So I'll start with some changes that people went through, and then after that I'll go through the experiences and the process that they went through. So uh, a common theme that we found in the interviews, and you, in the top right you can see the gender and uh, uh, if the person is Jewish and Arab based on language, which is the main a differentiator, so Hebrew letters or Arabic letters. If there is something that is infinite, so clearly it cannot be confronted with a story. This is what I see even with the biblical scholars who join, and also me and the Arabs. All become more believing, but somehow less fundamentalist. In a sense, I'm much more deeper in Judaism than I was, but I understand much more how it lives with the other conflicting opinions, because I'm not looking for a solution of contradictions, but on the contrary. So that element of also connection, connection to one's own religion, but not necessarily in a fundamentalist way. So one, one Palestinian guy said that he moved from, be, from being a nationalist, uh, an atheist nationalist, to a pacifist Muslim. Uh, so we kind of see things that we might not kind of uh, uh, expect uh, in a very cl clear way. Other changes that we saw are uh, general accept acceptance. So Part of that space and part of what people learn with the, in ayahuasca in a group setting is to accept the other, whether what, whatever is the other. And in that space, the other is also Jewish or Arab. And so there's a, the idea of acceptance is quite prevalent in this space. We saw uh, people uh, saying that it erased the definition of political identity. So people kind of, be, their political identity become less, more, more fused and less clear. Uh, there's strong bonds within each ayahuasca tribe. So in Israel, there are many ayahuasca circles. Uh, each circle is uh, a, a tribe. So strong bonds within the tribe. And more connection with the other, so a Jewish to an Arab also outside the tribe was some of the changes people reported. Uh, there was strong connection to the land and healing of trauma, which I'll speak about more in, in next slides. And uh, something quite surprising and a very common theme that we saw is the reduction or transformation of activism. Uh, so a certain tension between mysticism and activism. Uh, uh, an example for this is 
a woman that was quite active before. I'm less activist politically because I less believe in it. I believe in softer work, less political, perhaps because I'm matured, maybe because of the medicine. So people really have challenges with continuing doing activism because they say that activism is, has an energy of anger, that they cannot continue in work, working in that way, though they're still active, active in changing reality by uh, ar artists would kind of transform what they learned uh, through art. A school teacher in a mixed school said that she started uh, working with the children in the school, Jewish and Arabs, and started to do guided imagery. Uh, so imagining being the other side, and that's from her experiences with ayahuasca of seeing and being the other side. Uh, and most, probably most common is the spread of ayahuasca as means for peace. So that's kind of a way of continuing and doing some activism. Uh, but the ones who continued to do activism, uh, they say that kind of transformed them to do activism with love. My activism work has changed tremendously. A big part of what I realized was how much this activism, even nonviolent activism, was motivated by hatred towards the other. And my activism as nonviolence meant that I would expose them and I would amplify them, how terrible they are. So it was more of a demonizing, nonviolent, motivated by hatred, not by love and compassion. So he transformed the way he's doing activism by being compassionate to his enemy, in a way. But actually, that brought a lot of tension in his life. Uh, so in his circles of other activists, uh, a lot of people criticize him for, for being that, so for this change in him. And I, I actually think that also what Gail spoke about yesterday, of how you don't just put guilt on, on the other people, is kind of similar to that. So an activism, a certain compassionate activism. So the experience and process that people went through. So we'll start with uh, trauma and processing trauma. And uh, one example is of an uh, Israeli woman who has been harassed by an Ar Arab when she was young. And she sits in a ceremony. And the uh, Arab woman next to her uh, started uh, having quite a challenging experience and started to pray, Allah min Allah, Allah min Allah. And that kind of triggers her, like, her trauma. And she says she had to send to that woman next to her a lot of light and love to help her in the process. And in a way that she healed her own uh, past trauma and much more connected to Arabs since this moment. But that idea of like an Arab prayer like uh, Allah Wakbal that is heard in that shared space is something that triggers many people. And in a way, they need to work through this. Another story is of an Israeli soldier. Uh, um, he, was a, he was a soldier. And he joined the ceremony with a group of other four Palestinians. Uh, one of the Palestinians started crying in the ceremony, and then the four Palestinians started crying. And, and it kind of triggered in this Israeli guy uh, the pain of the whole Palestinian uh, nation. And it immediately sent him to a very, very strong vision, one of the strongest visions he had, and it's in which he kind of goes back to an experience he had in the army of just doing a casual house arrest and entering a house, arresting, arresting a young guy, taking him out and just putting him uh, kind of into, into a jeep and driving. And then he have a cut in the scene and he re-experienced everything from the side of the family that were sitting in the house. I just sat with them in the living room. It was as if I had gone back in time. I sat with the family in the living room and I saw them drinking coffee. They talk and laugh. The grandfather plays with the grandson. They're enjoying. There was a television on the side. Everything was great. And suddenly there was a knock on the door. It was very strange. I do not understand what is happening. I see the person I'm supposed to arrest escaping from the room, and then I, the grandmother or someone opens the door, and I just see myself, like Robocop, with a ski mask. I see my eyes clearly. I look at me, and I'm freezing from fear. I feel the heartbreak and intense fear in the room. I'm looking at myself, and I cannot believe that I'm the person standing there. I look terrible, and I aim the weapon. I really felt the hatred toward me being built, and it was a terrible experience. I saw me and my friend arresting the guy, and I took him out, and the door closed, and I stayed with them. I just see a family that is completely pulled into pieces, that at this moment their world is shattered. I see the little brothers, and I'm sure we raised three generations of terrorists who will surely hate me, and maybe they will remember my eyes through the ski mask as the man who destroyed their life. And it completely broke me. I was really angry with myself and hated me, and said, it does not matter Israel, Palestine, whatever, I cannot believe I did it. So after he has this strong vision, he goes with his consciousness back to the ceremony space, and he feels completely full of sorrow and guilt and shame. 
uh, and kind of he says it's one of the most hard ex hardest experience he had. Uh, and then he says that through ayahuasca channel through him uh, Hebrew Ikaros, which is Ikaros he knew, and the Ikaros discusses kind of the lyrics of the Ikaros are, are about his connection to the land. Uh, and that Ikaros released his tension, released the tension in the group as well, and the Palestinians, and he has a, since then a, a strong friendship with the Palestinians in this group. He also left the reserve the army, and he also started learning Arabic. Uh, so this is the transformation he went through this experience. Uh, another completing experience of becoming the other is, is of a Palestinian, uh, kind of having a strong vision of him as an Israeli soldier, shooting a Palestinian, and kind of staying with the guilt of that uh, moment. So uh, people discuss processing a collective trauma or grief. Suddenly I feel the first time that I can, I can connect with all the fathers who lost a child in the war, in the conflict here. Suddenly I had this thought, and it was also my first cry in public in a ceremony. Okay, so here we see a kind of a cathartic emotional release of a collective trauma, collective grief, okay? Connecting to his own uh, side. So this is a person who's quite left-wing, quite pacifist, uh, but suddenly he also connect to the pain of, like, let's say, the, the soldiers and people who actually he dis dis disproves most of the time. A story of intergenerational trauma. So this is an Arab guy who uh, was kind of... Uh, uh, grew up in an Israeli system, and he says he w has kind of been brainwashed by the Israeli system, so he was always quite disconnected from his Arab background. Uh, and he sits in a ceremony uh, in, uh, in a town that used to be Arab, but now uh, in '48 it became Israeli after the evacuation of Palestinians from many towns in Israel. And he sits in a ceremony. We came to a house that is supposedly Arab, but Jewish religious people lived there. We were four Arabs and all the rest dressed in white apparently religious people. And they sang songs on the angels of Israel, biblical songs. So it's a song, Boachem Shalom, Malachi Shalom. So it's a, 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 a Jewish prayer. And I went out, and suddenly I had a very strong hallucination. I see there was a balcony there, and there are houses, like my grandfather's house, in the village we grew up in, old Arab houses, and it hit me there. Hit me, and I remember I started to see. I saw the owners of this house in hallucination, I saw an old man like my grandfather and an old woman like my grandmother with a scarf on her head, and I began to interview them. They were very good people, and they softened me with the things they were talking about. Mainly the woman spoke to me. I know you have studied in an Israeli school, and I know that you hate everything related to Arab culture and Arabs, and that you have anger, and that you have this and that. But the story is different. You heard the story from one side. You did not hear our side. You're in our house now, and we're not here. We've been expelled. Okay? So he has this vision, and after this vision, he becomes quite angry. He returns to the ceremony space, uh, which is still uh, kind of with uh, Jewish, Jewish songs, and he started singing Arabic in Arabic on purpose in a very disharmonious way and in a very angry way, uh, kind of to disrupt the, the ceremony. Uh, so the shaman invites him next to him, and the shaman then starts singing songs in Arabic, uh, Lebanese songs of uh, Feiruz, and uh, the kind of the, the, at that moment that kind of transform into an Arab uh, celebration. So everybody are dancing to Arab music after this experience. Uh, this person comes back home and he says he kind of reconciles with his own identity, with his own background, and uh, he tr kind of reduces his stress in his life. This this moment of kind of there was an identity tension around there, and uh, it kind of helped him with anxiety in his life. He also tattooed on his arm a tattoo that mentions his connection to the land. So the land. Uh, this is, there are four, sorry, three visions of Arab women that had, had very similar visions. And these visions are visions related to the uh, trauma of the land and being connected to the trauma of the land. So I'll share a story of one of these women. <clears throat> so it was Yom, Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the kind of the holiest day for Jewish people. Uh, and, and, she's, and she's Muslim, and she says, it was Yom, in Yom Kippur, and out of me came the opening paragraph of the Quran. And another strong frequency got open, and I understood how much pain was in Pachamama, who hurts, who hurts from much red in the country, how much blood, how much pain, and how much anger. When I sang it, I sang it from a place of full presence. It was on the evening of the atonement, the vision was strong, and after that, I did not stop crying. OK? 
pain. We have similar stories of other Arab women connecting to the pain of the land and the trauma of the land. Uh, so we see here a connection that's mentioned by a few of the interviewees between the Holy Land and Pachamama. She came to help us as two nations to live on the same Mother Earth. The Earth is not for the Jews or Palestinians. This is Mother Earth, a gift. Both sides look after her. She enables, she hugs. So why do we do this? Okay, and the idea that the, if the land is holy, uh, treating Pachamama in uh, a war is an un un unholy act, and this is the way people treat Pachamama. So there's a kind of a strong connection uh, between those in that space. Uh, so, on that respect, I want to give a shout out to the feminine, a uh, session also in the next door about the feminine, and I, I believe it plays a kind of a crucial role also here in the, whatever feminine is, whatever, whatever it, even if it's just a social construct, but the kind of the feminine energy uh, plays an a important role in the reconciliation. I would like to mention the work of Rian Isler and the book The Chalice in the Blade, uh, and where she discusses uh, that societies that live in more partnership we're also societies that worship, uh, worship the goddess, uh, but that uh, ma the male-female uh, kind of relationship is the primary relationship in which we learn from, in which we learn any other relationship based on this. So if men own women, then men also own other men, and men also own the land. Uh, but if uh, men and women live in partnership, then the land and men live in partnership as well. Uh, so this is the kind of the exemplary relationship. Uh, so we see here a kind of a, based on the few slides, uh, transformation on these two elements, on trauma and connection to land. Uh, I would speak from my own background, which is a Z Z from Zionist background, uh, but it's also related to Palestinian. But for Jewish people, uh, the idea of living in Israel comes from both of these uh, energies, these, both of these fuel uh, the life of uh, Jewish people in Israel. One is the trauma of anti-Semitism, needing to find a sp safe space for uh, Jewish people in Israel. But this is a fear-driven policy, okay? So healing trauma is also healing the policy that's based on fear. Uh, and connection to land, the spiritual connection to the land, to the land of the fathers. Uh, but here we can kind of see a transformation uh, of the connection to the land, of maybe a connection of ownership, to a connection of partnership with the land, okay? And just on that note, it's important to remember that trauma is a most of the time a relational wound. It happens in the relational space, and it's good to heal it also in the relational space. But how can you heal trauma if the trauma is ongoing? You can't heal it, but you can just bring a shovel and dig some shit out every once in a while, okay? It's just good to remember that trauma is ongoing. It doesn't belong to the past. Okay, we move to uh, connection. Okay, the trauma was the difficult part here. Uh, we move to connection. Okay, so different types of connection that happen in this space. Uh, kind of a common one is a, a connection of camaraderie, as if we're just going through a difficult process together. I really felt that everyone are purging for me. Okay, so we're, we're puking, we're purging, we're suffering, we're crying, we're kind of going through a process together. Uh, another Israeli guy actually said that if you, if you go through a whole night and you do uh, next to Israelis and Palestinians, it kind of dissolves. Uh, and it, it's kind of, you do this kind of stupid thing like uh, and all of these kind of funny noises, and that kind of dissolves the identities uh, as well. So uh, a common theme is the experience of oneness. You reach a point in which everybody really has one brain. Okay, so we're kind of seeing here a certain uh, strong connection that feel, the group feels really like one. Uh, but not just that, but there's also just a connection between group mem members, a connection beyond culture. So there were moments of love and open-heartedness that were all together. There is no, you are Jewish, Arab, Muslim, Christian. Everything was stripped. All this nonsense was out. And only acceptance and love were present. Uh, so this is similar to idea of uh, Victor and Edith Turner suggested uh, the idea of communitas. So communitas and Hannes uh, spoke about it uh, two days ago. Communitas is the process that in a, in a ritual process, uh, regardless of psychedelics, there is a liminal moment in which social constructions are, are dissolved and people can relate to each other based on shared humanity. So not based on hierarchies or power dynamics, 
or other, or other social constructs. So this was a very common theme uh, in these groups. So connection beyond culture. But not just that, I have to say that another very common theme was actually a connection uh, to the other. So it's a connection based on the other's culture. And usually through music. Almost every retreat there is a moment in which they, a small group of Palestinians uh, in this uh, specific story, are comfortable enough to sing in Arabic. This is always an amazing moment. Suddenly you hear your most hated language, by far, maybe the only language in the world that you really didn't like, and suddenly it sends you to light and love. Okay, so this is a very common moment that uh, a Jewish would listen to Arabic and suddenly it sends him to um, a spiritual state or the opposite. Uh, and this is uh, from an Arab woman that kind of she, she's facilitating as well. In Israel, there is resistance toward anything that is Arab, whether it is language or if it is a human, though they love the hummus. <laughs> so I want to bring it by singing from a frequency that will touch. They come to me and ask me, will you sing to us tonight? Okay, so there's a really deep yearning to connect based on one person singing, but it's actually connecting to a whole culture through that. Uh, yeah, so uh, music makes the people come together, uh, like Madonna said, and uh, they're kind of uh, few, few, and that was a very common theme, the importance of music, of course, to heal the relational space. Uh, listening to your own music from your own culture uh, provides safety and belonging. So an Arab woman that was in a ceremony uh, for the first time, and there were many Jewish songs, started to become paranoid that this is a Jewish brainwash. Uh, and it kind of she got scared in the ceremony space, and she came to her friend, who just read her a few uh, paragraphs from the Quran, uh, and she suddenly felt safe again. So uh, music of your own culture provides safety and belonging. Uh, music of the other culture provides expansion. So people describe this, as for me as Jewish, listening to Arabic, as an uh, experience of expansion. So the group expands, chest or actually expands in the phys physical space. Uh, suddenly everybody realized that there's a special moment. Uh, and that's an expansion of identity as well, embracing something which was other than me uh, until then. And universal culture, so uh, Amazon, like anything outside of the land. Uh, Amazonian uh, or shamanism or Indian music uh, or even pop music, Beatles, things which everybody are kind of uh, uh, related to, uh, provides a unity moment. Okay, everybody are together singing a song together. But I cannot go to a checkpoint and be like, I'm a human being, let me go through. I'm a spiritual light being, don't you know? Uh, so of course, they're going from these unitive moments back to a political reality can be quite challenging. And you can go through a shared night together, but in the end, there are checkpoints, there are walls. So, I'll talk about uh, two elements of the belief that's quite common in, uh, by most of our interviewees, almost all of them probably, and is two themes, uh, very new agey, probably the core of new age, uh, all is one, and peace starts from within, an inner process. Okay, so this is of course common uh, themes in psychedelic culture, Dr. Bronner, who's the main, uh, not the main, but uh, uh, funder of MAPS, who donated the, the, the most, I think, until now to MAPS, uh, and uh, also a sponsor of this conference, uh, All One, and the Ayahuasca conference that was a few months ago. Uh, the uh, slogan was, an inner search for a better world. Okay, so many people talk about that peace is an inner process. So we'll talk first about All is One. So the, there's a universal, the common universal interpretation of All is One. My worldview is universal, and the monotheistic religion stopped serving us in this era, and we must move to a united universal culture. Okay, uh, and this was quite a common sentiment. Uh, and uh, this is from an Arab woman. In the morning, the organizer said, "It's so nice to be able to do this work in a mixed group, but we have we have here also Arabs and also Jews." And for me, at that point, she broke everything. Her intention was good, yeah. It came from a good place, but I didn't realize it until that point, until that moment, everybody was the same. There was no difference. Everybody goes through a night which is difficult, and everybody in the morning hugs. There is this energy that goes through, and there is no difference. And the moment she said it, suddenly she created the difference again. 
Uh, so we see here actually a pain of going back into kind of the reality, the political reality in a way. An Arab woman that lives in Israel, most of the time when she relates to Israelis, she's kind of stuck in her identity. She doesn't have a lot of opportunities to be an, an individual in that relationship and, uh, or, or a universal. Uh, but for these moments, she does have this opportunity, but it's quite painful to come back uh, to a reality that talks about the differences. And I'd like to mention here an idea that the, the trauma of identity uh, of, of many years of humanity, of, of people uh, kind of creating pain, pain based on identity to each other, uh, might lead to this idea of extreme universalism. Let's erase the differences. Uh, so like, like what she kind of mentions here, or it might lead to the other extreme of uh, certain politics that are right now in the world in both left and right of just having a even stronger, more rigid uh, in-group uh, identities. So all is one has a pluralistic interpretation as well. <clears throat> the beauty in the difference, we're not all the same. Who said we should all be the same? The beauty is in the difference and the diversity of different languages, the different frequencies. It is all physics. Everything has a wavelength. The Arab letters have a wavelength. Hebrew has a wavelength. English has a wavelength. You're a wavelength. I'm a wavelength. There are endless wavelengths. And at the merging of all the wavelengths, there is the one which encompasses all colors. Uh, so the metaphor for this is maybe an inverted prism, uh, the rainbow. Uh, so you need all colors to kind of reach the white light. So it's a metaphor that takes all as one and kind of puts a multicultural, pluralistic take on, on it. So the expression of each one in the circle is an important thing for the fuller to become full. So I will, I will skip this, but peace starts from within. Uh, is a, the idea of inner peace was quite a common theme, but it's important to know that peace continues uh, between as well. So it needs to continue between. It cannot just be an inner process. And the idea of interbeing of Thich Nhat Hanh is uh, relevant here. So we're all in this kind of relational matrix and contribute to each other. Uh, so I would like to mention here uh, both Aldous Huxley and Martin Buber and put them kind of next to each other. Uh, perennial philosophy is probably the most important book uh, or, uh, that represents uh, the core of New Age. So the idea of withinness, uh, oneness, and non-dual experiences and mysticism. A lot of us know it here, but I'd like to put next to it uh, Martin's Buber work, I and Thou, uh, which kind of puts an emphasis on the betweenness, okay? So Buber would say, uh, that if you feel that it's a connection, then it's probably not one. It's a connection must happen between two. So these are sometimes non-non-dual experiences, okay? Uh, and, and, and the idea that sometimes it might feel like oneness, but it's just a very, very strong connection. And from that connection, we can learn about also the connection with other human beings and the spiritual uh, kind of uh, core in any human connection regard in, in case we relate to each other without using each other or, ex or experience, just for the experience of each other. Uh, so we kind of have a dual take on uh, mysticism. And I think it's relevant here and it's relevant uh, uh, to many of the stories we, we heard, both of the people relating to each other, but let's say also Muslim a Muslim woman that connects to, uh, to God, an unmediated connection to her God, is more of the I and Tao interpretation. So can ayahuasca promote peace? Uh, maybe, yes, uh, we don't know. We kind, of, we kind of think that there's a potential there. Uh, we, we believe that putting emphasis on the relational next to the inner is uh, important to do this. Uh, and when we asked our interviews, they said, yes, if you give it to politicians. Uh, that was the most common uh, answer, of course. Uh, but it's good to remember a few tensions here. Uh, one is around... Uh, mysticism and activism. So mysticism on the kind of, if we put it to the extremes, is inner work. Activism is outer work. Uh, so there's a need to kind of work on both. There are a few quite beautiful examples of how mysticism internalizes uh, politics. One is of uh, ecstatic Kabbalah, uh, 13th century Abraham Abulafia uh, in Spain. Uh, kind of uh, an ecstatic form of Kabbalah. Uh, in which ideas like redemption, which is a political idea of Jewish coming back to Israel, uh, becomes internalized of redemption of, from the alienation of the self. So self-redemption, an idea like the Messiah, a political figure, uh, becomes an inner Messiah, a potential that we all have for redemption. 
Uh, another example is in the rave, Palestinian rave scene. Uh, so Nadim Kurkabi from University of Haifa studies the Palestinian rave scene. And over there, you, you, you can see that the ecstatic experience kind of changed people from talking about Tahrir, which is the liberation of Palestinians, to Taharur, which is uh, a self-liberation, but the self-liberation as a political act. Uh, there's tension between reconciliation and decolonization. So some people say, would say that you cannot do reconciliation before you actually change political reality. There's a tension between what is universality uh, or maybe it's assimilation. So if a universality to a form of new age, uh, which is not necessarily fits uh, Muslim culture, might be a form of assimilation. And there's a tension between what is inner peace uh, but actually what people reported to us that inner peace is the most important process. Uh, they're working on that, but at the same time, uh, they're planning to move to Portugal uh, to live in a community because uh, life in Israel is hard. Uh, so there, there are tensions there, of course. Yeah, uh, I'll just, that's it, I'm finishing here. Uh, I'll mention a prophetic visions, two prophetic visions, uh, religious themes were quite common. Uh, and they're both kind of visions that re actual visions that relate to the temple. Uh, one Jewish uh, uh, gender non-conforming uh, kind of mentioned that he had a vision of a binational third temple or a temple that would be for all people. Uh, and another Arab woman actually mentioned a vision in which she saw the Al-Aqsa Mosque and I saw Palestinian Israeli flags and it was full of smoke of war. And, this, and said this war, and Ayahuasca said, this war will continue. And in the future, they will fight on the mosque and there will be smoke and fi fire. Wow, I don't want this. Okay, so maybe an apocalyptic uh, dystopian uh, vision. So all potential, all, all futures are uh, possible here. That's it, financial support by uh, Moshe Tov Kreps and uh, MAPS. Moshe was amazing also in the process of uh, uh, processing with us and intellectually a lot of the interviews, and uh, the Imperial uh, Center for Psychedelic Research, and special thanks to Antoine Saka and Natalie Ginsberg for working on this together, for Rick and Robin for supervising, and mainly for the community that kind of put trust in us uh, for these interviews. Yeah.